Hello everyone, this is Nitpicky Nerd and this is my full spoiler review of the third episode of the third season of Star Trek Picard called 17 Seconds. And in my opinion, this is probably the best episode of Star Trek Picard so far and probably the best Trek episode in the last 20 years. Now, it doesn't mean it's a perfect episode, I still have uh, four pages of notes about things I can nitpick and I will nitpick about them, but at least I'm doing it with fun. Because overall I think the episode was good, and with a lot of potential of things to come, it really does look as if it might be an awesome season. So this is a final spoiler warning for those who haven't seen the episode, because I'm going to go right into the big surprise of the episode, which is that the big villains are the founders from Deep Space Nine. Or more accurately, some of them. We don't know their exact number, but a group of changelings who didn't accept losing the Dominion War, who want to continue doing what uh, the Founders were doing in uh, the middle of Deep Space Nine, before the Dominion War. They were infiltrating all the major powers of the Alpha Quadrant and turning them against each other, trying to weaken all of them, to take them over later. And so apparently they're trying to do the same thing again. And that's something I always loved about Deep Space Nine and I always wanted more of that and so that's why I do like this revelation. And it is kind of similar to what I was hoping for with the bugs from the episode Conspiracy coming back finally to try to take over the Federation again. I still think that's probably would have been slightly better because, you know, that would have wrapped up nicely that loose end from TNG from way in season one of TNG which ended on that cliffhanger of those bugs potentially coming back in the distant future and so I still probably would have liked it more if that was the case but the changeling infiltration as we saw in the Space Nine is kind of a similar idea anyway so it finally explains the whole conspiracy I was worried when someone told me that uh, the bugs are not involved I was worried that they're just going to do something stupid of just a group or a coalition of different aliens and humans just uh, planning a conspiracy which would have been stupid so the changeling reveal is kind of a relief because at least it's going to be something fun and logical and it continues something which I did always want to see more of namely that uh, plotline from Deep Space Nine which was kind of dropped uh, in the Dominion War itself unfortunately and they did have that excuse in the show that uh, all the founders were infected by the virus which prevented them from changing form and that's why we didn't really see any changeling infiltration anymore and all of that so part of me is happy that we're going to see more of that kind of stuff and with today's special effect it can all be done much better but on the other hand I still think the conspiracy bugs would have been uh, better overall because it would tie up that loose end they could have said the bugs upgraded themselves and they're not so easy to spot anymore and maybe they will have new abilities inside their host and maybe we'll have uh, biological ships kind of like uh, you know species 8472 maybe the bugs will come on actual biological ships which are like uh, giant bugs themselves uh, or something like that i think it would have been uh, slightly new of course that idea is not totally original you know stargate sg1 did a lot of stuff with parasites uh, taking over people and many other movies and shows did that but uh, still they could have done it in a new way and it would explain why Beverly contacted Picard specifically. Because if she knew that he is now in a synthetic body, then she would know that maybe he's the only one who cannot physically be taken over by those bugs. And that's why she can trust him specifically and not her other friends from TNG. She turns to Picard specifically because she would know for sure that he cannot possibly be infected and controlled by those bugs because he's now in a synthetic body. So that would make sense. And the biggest uh, thing that annoyed me in this episode is that Beverly apparently didn't know anything about the changelings being involved and so if that's the case why did she tell him not to trust anyone and not to trust Starfleet if she didn't know about it yet and why did she vaporize that guy who came to her ship which I think they did imply that he probably was a changeling because when Riker found his remains on the floor he did say that his ashes look kind of different from the normal ashes that are left when someone is vaporized. And so I guess that's a clue that he was a shapeshifter. Even though if he was a shapeshifter, then why didn't he use his shapeshifting powers to try to get Beverly? I mean, if a bunch of changelings beamed over to that ship or docked with that ship, couldn't they use some uh, more clever shapeshifty way to try to capture them? Why just go around these humanoids firing guns? And if Beverly didn't know he's a shapeshifter, then she has no justification of vaporizing that guy after he was on the floor. I mean, if she did know that, then I could have forgiven her for vaporizing him when he was down, when he was wounded. Because we all know how dangerous shapeshifters are, that he would be able to get away and kill them and all of that. So I could have been able to forgive her, but if she didn't know it's a changeling, then it's still unforgivable. It's still a morality problem of how she 
shot at him when he was on the floor. So that's probably the biggest complaint I have against this episode, that Beverly had no idea about the changelings. Maybe they should have kept her unconscious for an episode longer and wake her up only after we got this reveal and then have Beverly tell the whole story that she did know about the changelings when she sent the message. Maybe Jack didn't know about it yet, but she just discovered it. And that's why she shot that guy dead who invaded her ship. And uh, maybe they'll explain later that maybe not all of those aliens are changelings because uh, Vadik is not a changeling because we keep seeing her smoking. And uh, I didn't mention it before, but I thought it's kind of silly how they make her smoke just to look cool or something. But now I think it's done deliberately as a clue that we'll know that she's not a changeling because I'm pretty sure Odo said in one episode that he has no sense of smell and that he has no lungs, he doesn't need to breathe. So why is she smoking if she's a changeling? So I'm sure that she's not. Also changelings didn't have names and yet she uses a name to identify herself. So I'm pretty sure she's just working with them and maybe not all those uh, people on her ship are changelings because they don't seem to be behaving like changelings. So I'm kind of hoping the ones who invaded her ship uh, were not changelings because it wouldn't make sense why didn't they use their powers then to get to her more easily. And uh, Riker saying that the ashes looked strange, maybe it will be revealed some other strange aliens are involved and not just the changelings. They kind of sound like those aliens from the episode Schisms, who were abducting the crew to some other dimension because they were also talking with the cliques and all of that, so they actually remind me of those aliens. So I'm guessing maybe not all the villains are changelings, but the big reveal of the episode is that the faction of the changelings are once again doing the same thing they did in Deep Space Nine and uh, the, the portal weapon they stole is just part of it, it's just a distraction. Maybe it's only part of their plan that they stole something else from Daystrom which is even more dangerous. So I immediately thought about Lore who was probably being studied there and maybe Moriarty was there as well. So maybe the Changeling simply released all the big villains from the previous shows just to fuck with Starfleet. And that guy we saw in the ship uh, having that weird evil look in the first episode did turn up to be a changeling in this one. But again, if it's a changeling, then why he's stuck in a single form? Why is he always this one ensign? He can basically be anyone on the ship. So why not just impersonate the captain at some point and then just uh, surrender to Vadik right away? So unless they explain it later, maybe this group of changelings are weaker somehow. Maybe they are still infected by some weaker version of that virus from a... Uh, Section 31, maybe they were not completely cured, maybe it somehow limits their abilities. Maybe they are not the best changelings that uh, the Great Ling had, maybe the better ones stayed on the same side as Odo and only the younger, more reckless changelings are the ones doing all of this and they are uh, less skilled than the ones who are causing all the trouble during Deep Space Nine. And why doesn't Odo send some good changelings to stop the bad changelings? is also a big question, so I do still have a whole bunch of logical problems, that's why I wish they would have gone with the conspiracy bugs, because it could explain all this stuff better, that maybe the bugs cannot so easily possess new hosts, maybe because Starfleet is now using some new technology to scan everyone all the time, so it's not so easy to possess someone undetected, and that's why only this one ensign is the saboteur, and it's not so easy to transfer to someone else, and so I wish these kinds of things would be explained better so that I wouldn't have to scratch my head, so that it wouldn't take me out of the story, because I want to enjoy the story. And overall, I did enjoy this episode. So the Titan is still being chased inside the nebula by the Shrike, the ship of the villains, who, by the way, you can actually see it in the opening sequence. When you see the Titan flying around, you can see the Shrike somewhere in the background hiding in the nebula, so that's kind of cool. And the sensors are not working properly in the nebula, which is okay, I guess. It's a neat excuse to have the limitations. And uh, at some point, Captain Shaw says, someone go back and look at the rear windows of the ship to let us know if they see the ship of the bad guys. And that seems kind of silly to me. At first, I thought he was joking, that he didn't literally mean it. But later in the episode, we see that people are literally standing at the back windows to try to spot the enemy ship with their naked eye. Now, I do remember that in early episodes of TNG, often Picard would send Jordi to look out of the window to have a real look, but Jordi had some unique piece of equipment on his eye, which maybe is better than the normal sensors or the normal cameras of the ship or whatever, so it kind of made sense then, but now he's uh, sending people to just look at, out the window at a vast area of space to just spot things with their naked eye. If at least they showed us that they use some kind of device, some kind of telescope or some kind of binoculars or something like that, 
then maybe it could make some sense. But no, they just stand around looking at the window with their naked eye. That kind of annoyed me. And how come the ship itself doesn't have some kind of physical cameras outside of the normal sensors and so that kind of annoyed me a little bit but i guess we can explain stuff like that with interference from the nebula interfering with electrical devices and all of that and it's also funny how now it makes sense why they had all the ship sets be so dark because uh, this nebula has some strange anomaly in it and it causes some energy surge uh, through the ship which lights up all the lights to normal brightness and so i guess that's why they did it otherwise it would be too bright if they made it brighter than normal then maybe it would be not pleasant to look at so they made everything darker all the time so that once in a while that energy surge would uh, turn on the lights basically so that we'll see something weird is happening so it kind of slightly justifies why the sets were so dark in the beginning and uh, we also had the flashback scene of uh, Riker and Picard being in some bar from way back when uh, Riker was still the captain of the Titan shortly after the birth of his son and uh, it's pretty obvious they use some kind of de-aging technique on the actors in the scene and it's kind of slightly uncanny valley looking especially their eyes it's almost like they look Chinese uh, suddenly because someone tried to facelift them a little bit too much so that they look different from what the actors actually looked like at that age and so that was slightly distracting but at least they tried so it's better than those flashbacks we were getting in the first season of the show in which they didn't even bother you know even Data looked old for some reason and Riker tells Picard about how they had some trouble when his son was born, that he was called into sickbay, and that the turbolift trip from the bridge to sickbay took only 17 seconds, but for him it was the longest 17 seconds because he was so worried about his son, all of that. All of this scene is not just here as filler, but it actually ties with something that happens toward the end of the episode when something similar is happening with Picard and his son, and so that was deliberate, so I did kind of like that. Now, there were two things that annoyed me in the scene. First of all, at some point, uh, Troy suddenly calls him, complaining about uh, that she's alone taking care of the baby while he's off in a bar drinking. And uh, she appears on a hologram screen right next to them and yet apparently doesn't notice Picard. She only talks with Riker, not even saying hi for one second to Picard, uh, so as if she doesn't see him. So I wish they would have did the effect slightly different so that she would be at an angle facing only Riker and then uh, we can explain that that she simply didn't see him there and all of that also she tells Riker to bring the whiskey and yet he doesn't when he leaves the scene he doesn't take the bottle so I guess she was joking but she was kind of being annoying how complaining about taking care of the baby and all of that even though you would think you know with all the hologram technology and all of that what's the problem of creating a few babysitters around the baby so that you wouldn't have to literally hold it all the time and to replace diapers on all of that so it kind of annoyed me again it makes it look like today too much even though it's in the far future in which uh, such uh, things should be easier so why is she complaining so much and another thing that bugged me in the scene is that Riker kept telling Picard how awesome it is to have kids what a great uh, feeling it is that he should try it and all of that and I keep thinking why do they keep forgetting the episode the inner light in which Picard experienced the whole other lifetime in which he did have children and he said in later episodes as well that that experience was completely real for him that he felt as if he really did live there and had those children and all of that it was absolutely real to him he said that in another episode so we cannot claim that it faded later on that he forgot some of those memories and experiences and so for him he should have the memories and experiences of having children and yet for some reason the show completely forgot about that so that annoys me and it happened before uh, back in season one in that episode when he met Riker and also they talked with him about that, that he doesn't know what it's like to deal with teenagers and all of that, even though they should know that he did experience that at some point. And also later in the episode when he talks with Beverly, Beverly says that he told her that he never wants to have children because of his own bad childhood, that he's afraid he'll be like his father. But again, he experienced a whole lifetime after that in which he did have kids. And even when he was in the Nexus in Generations, he had that vision of having a family and a bunch of kids and seemed so happy about that so you would think those experiences would change him and yet Beverly talks to him as if uh, she only remembers the very first uh, seasons of TNG before all those events and as if she didn't know him after that so it doesn't really make sense so those small details kind of annoy me and also there's a scene when Jordi's daughter comes to visit Seven because Seven is still locked up in her quarters for some reason even after Captain Shaw gives command over to Riker anyway I didn't get to that yet 
But even after that, everyone kind of forgot about Seven. She stays locked up in her quarters. So Jordi's daughter comes to visit her to cheer her up, I guess. And then she says something about how no one wanted her to be a pilot because everyone knew that she's the daughter of the greatest engineer in Starfleet. And so everyone wanted her to also go into engineering and yet she wanted to be a pilot. And it annoyed me because Jordi was a pilot too. In the beginning of TNG, in the first season, he was the pilot of the ship. Only later he became an engineer. So how come his daughter... Even if people want her to follow the footsteps of her father, she can simply always reply that her father used to be a pilot in the beginning as well. So what's the big deal? What's the problem? So that also annoyed me as if the show forgot that Jordi used to be a pilot. He wasn't just an engineer in his whole career. He started out as a pilot. Now, I do like it that they properly develop all the minor bridge characters and they make them all likable and lovable. And so that's something they do well in this episode. And they seem to be good at their job. Everyone knows what he's talking about. I also liked how Beverly is helping out in sickbay. You know, we do see her doing doctor stuff. So even though they turned her into Ripley in the first episode, but now she's back to being a doctor and they show why she's a good doctor and all of that. So that was good as well. And there's a great scene when Picard comes to talk with her in sickbay to explain how come she never told him that uh, they have a son together. And you know, I was worried about this, I was uh, fearing this will just be soap opera nonsense and that it wouldn't make sense, but somehow I ended up liking it. Even the acting was suddenly great by both of these actors and the dialogue actually makes sense. You know, when Beverly says that the main reason was that she knew her son would be in danger if people in the galaxy knew that he's Picard's son. And that makes sense, especially because, you know, Beverly was there in that episode when the Ferengi Bok tried to kill the fake son of Picard. He pretended it to be his son, he changed his DNA so that Picard will think it's his son just to kill him because he was angry about something that happened years before. And so Beverly was there in those events, she would remember them, so it kind of makes sense why she would want to protect her son from all the many enemies that Picard has around the galaxy. And they had that quick line to explain away his accent. Uh, she said that he grew up in London, that he was in a school in London, that's why he has a British accent. But it kind of ruins the previous explanation of the dangers from the galaxy. I mean, uh, Earth is the capital of the Federation. You would think that's the safest place in the galaxy, that uh, there should be no worries about your safety if he's not on a starship somewhere. But I guess maybe with the open borders policy of the Federation, maybe security on Earth is not really that great, that any alien can come to visit Earth and kill their son and all of that. So maybe that's why she just wanted to keep it completely anonymous and secret so that no one would know about it. So I guess they were using a fake name so that Picard would never be able to find Beverly. I mean, Beverly was probably on Earth as well. And so Picard wasn't able to look her up, but she completely disappeared for everyone. That means they were using fake aliases, fake names while living on Earth. I did like the excuse that uh, at some point when he was old enough that she did tell the son about his father, Picard, and that it was his choice not to come to talk with him. I guess maybe that happened after Picard retired. To his vineyard maybe that's when Beverly decided maybe it's safe now that he wouldn't be making new enemies in the galaxy and maybe that's when she told her kid about uh, Picard being his father and yet he didn't want to talk with him and both of their points of view both of their arguments make perfect sense both sides have really good points and so it's not a black and white issue it's complex and it's complicated and that's what makes it interesting in my opinion and the acting was good and it sold it and so that's why I do like the scene and after Picard was told that his son didn't want to contact him, that's why he kind of gives up and doesn't even want to talk with him. And then Riker confronts him about it and says, that's your son, talk to him. And I think Jonathan Frakes is uh, maybe the best uh, thing in this whole show. Every time he's on screen, he's absolutely 100% feels like Riker, maybe except the very last scene, which I will get to. And as for the question, how did Beverly even get pregnant if it happened after Nemesis? She was kind of too old for that, but you know, it's the 21st century, so with their medical technology, it's not really an issue. What is an issue is how come she didn't use any preventive measures. I mean, it should be really easy in the future as well. So I guess she wanted to get pregnant and then didn't tell Picard because he was constantly under danger from all kinds of assassins at that time, which again, I can buy that, so I don't have a big problem with it. And she says that she got pregnant when they were together on some vacation on the planet Kasperia. That's the planet that Jadzia wanted to take Worf to on their honeymoon. And there's a scene when Riker talks with Jack and Jack says, I'm not a science experiment. And uh, that kind of made me laugh because, uh, you know, all those uh, theories that he might be some kind of clone. 
and Riker tells him, but I was watching you getting cooked up uh, while I was on the Enterprise. And uh, of course he meant uh, the relationship between Beverly and Picard, that he was uh, watching it grow while on the show and all of that. And also we see how other crew members react to Jack with anger, as if they're looking at him as if he's at fault for everything that is happening, that they're in danger. And there was one guy in Sigbay who looked at him directly and said, this is all your fault. That kind of gave me flashbacks of that Romulan senator from season one who was blaming Picard for things which was not his fault. And so that kind of reminded me of that. Also, it reminds me of Star Trek Discovery, you know, when Michael Burnham was walking around the ship and everyone were staring at her strangely because she was uh, the traitor and all of that. So... That kind of reminded me of that, but at least here it makes sense because, you know, they are all in danger because of Jack and Beverly, so it kind of makes sense for them to be angry, especially if they just got injured because of all of that. So at least it's kind of justified here, but uh, again, I want to see the enlightened Starfleet. At least they do develop the bridge crew properly and they make them likable. I do like that uh, science lady who seems like a Vulcan, but she's bold like a Delta, so maybe she's uh, some kind of hybrid, I don't know yet. So anyway, Picard doesn't want to talk with his son, he kind of gives up on that whole idea, he thinks this whole thing was a mistake, he wants to apologize to Captain Shaw for bringing the ship into danger, and then uh, Riker tells him, go and talk with your son, moments with your children are priceless and all of that, and that dialogue does feel really emotional because we know that, you know, Riker lost his son at some point. So anyway, they're getting attacked again and Captain Shaw gets heavily injured and then he transfers all his command codes to Riker. He wants Riker to be the captain of the ship. Even though earlier, you know, Picard kind of took over to command and so they kind of forgot about that now, I guess. And now uh, Riker is the captain and Picard is like his number one. He even tells him at some point, maybe it's time you call me number one and he's helping him out. And then suddenly tensions start rising between Riker and Picard because they have different ideas about what their strategy should be. For some reason Picard is now the aggressive one, he is the one who keeps saying they should turn around and fight. And Riker is the one who is more cautious, who wants to just hide and run away to protect the ship. So that doesn't really make sense since when is Picard the aggressive one? He was always the one who was most cautious, you know, not, never letting Worf do anything. Worf was always the one who wanted to fight and all of that, and Picard was the more cautious one who wanted to go and hide in nebulas and stuff like that. So now it's kind of reversed that Riker is the cautious one and Picard is the more uh, risk taker and all of that. So that felt slightly strange and it was all done just so that we'll have all this conflict and drama between them. And at some point they fire a torpedo at the enemy ship and they detonate it before it reaches it so that it will push that ship away from them. And at first I was annoyed by that thinking why wouldn't they simply let the torpedo hit the ship and explode right next to the ship, wouldn't that be more beneficial? But you know, I thought about it some more and actually it does make sense because, you know, torpedoes are basically antimatter bombs and so it's kind of similar to a nuclear explosion and if you explode a nuclear device in empty space in a vacuum, it wouldn't actually produce a shockwave if there is no atmosphere, if there is no gas around it. It would just produce radiation and light and not really produce a shockwave if there is nothing to carry the shockwave. And so if you explode a nuclear bomb inside an atmosphere, then it will create the heat and the shockwave and the rush of wind and all of that. So similarly here, if the torpedo exploded right next to that ship, its energy would just get absorbed by its shields and it wouldn't have the substance around it to create a shockwave. But because they detonated it in the middle of the gas cloud, the explosion of the torpedo creates that shockwave, that rush of wind that pushes that ship away. So it does kind of make sense why they detonated it at a distance because otherwise it would just get absorbed by the ship without creating that wind that pushes it away. And so it does kind of make sense, so I'm willing to accept it. And then it cuts to Rafi waking up and we hear the same music, that same opera that we heard Picard listen to in the beginning of First Contact, only now it's worth listening to it. So I guess Picard gave all his former crew members all of his favorite music, just like earlier we heard that he gave Beverly some of his music. So I guess he did the same for Worf, and it also ties to that scene in Insurrection, when he was telling Worf about some classical music and all of that, so maybe after that he wanted to educate him about classical music and gave him a collection of his favorite ones. And so we hear the same music as Worf is training with his new sword. And then we get an awesome introduction when he keeps giving himself all those titles like uh, Slayer of Gauron and stuff like that. 
and then suddenly do you take tea with sugar and give her some tea and I think all the scenes with Worf in this episode were great because he's both an awesome badass but also kind of comic relief as he always wore because you know in TNG he had a lot of funny moments and it's maybe because of his deadpan delivery because he's being totally serious like a great warrior but he's delivering funny lines at the same time like you know nice tea nice house and stuff like that and you know that scene when he was suddenly drinking tea with dr polaski stuff like that so it's like they took all those elements together and combined them and it makes it funny and even later when they go around the city looking for someone he complains that she's wearing a hood that only makes her look more suspicious and then she tells him look at who's talking with all that warrior gear and he says that's not warrior gear that's my casual clothing something like that so he has all these funny lines and it makes it feel like the classic Worf character who was always a badass but also funny at the same time and apparently he was never working for Starfleet Intelligence he's just pretending to and he recruited her to help him out and uh, I guess she's just so stupid that she never bothered to check if her handler was actually Starfleet Intelligence I guess it could have been anyone and she would just uh, obey the orders of anyone sending her on mission so that makes her look stupid but at least it explains away the complaint I had earlier of Worf just being like a vigilante, just uh, beheading people he doesn't like. It wouldn't make sense if he was working for Starfleet, but if he's working for himself or for some other shady organization, I guess we'll find out later, maybe it would make sense. And so that alleviates some of my complaints from earlier. Also, he says that he knew who the real attacker was, that it wasn't that Ferengi, that he knew everything that Ferengi knew. And so that also explains the way why he killed that Ferengi without interrogating him. So it kind of fixes some of the issues I had earlier. And if he knows the real big plot, he knows how dangerous all of the situation is. That would explain away the urgency and why he's willing to do kind of necessary evil to get the job done quickly and all of that. And also now that we know that changelings are involved, maybe beheading them is kind of a nice way to also check if they were changelings or not. Because you know, when you cut off a piece of the body of a changeling, it would revert to its liquid form. And so that kind of makes sense now why he uses a sword against all these guys, because when he kills them, he would know immediately if they are changelings or not. If it sprays blood everywhere, and the different body parts don't turn into liquid, then we know that it wasn't a changeling. So I guess that's a nice way to quickly check it. So now it kind of makes a little bit more sense why he uses a sword and not just a phaser. Even though a sword would be less effective against a changeling, wouldn't it? So if some of those guys were changelings, then he would be putting himself at risk. I guess he always had some backup phasers as well. So maybe also he carries some kind of device which prevents the changelings from changing shape. Maybe that's why that guy they captured wasn't able to change shape. They never really explained that. That also annoyed me. They made it look as if maybe the handcuffs he was wearing were preventing him from changing shape. Or maybe, hopefully, they explain it that Worf himself carries some kind of device on him that prevents shapeshifters from changing shape. And that's why he was able to so easily capture that guy even before he put the handcuffs on. And so Rafi is interrogating that guy before she knows it's a shapeshifter and she thinks he just has the shakes from not using the drug and so she tries to tempt him with the drug and all of that but at some point Worf reveals that it's actually because he's a changeling who approaches his regeneration cycle so he has to turn into a liquid form and I guess he cannot and so they never properly explained it yet but uh, again I hope it's something that Worf carries on himself then that would explain why a sword would be effective against them and how he was able to capture this guy by knocking him out somehow and at some point he kind of holds his head and only then that guy turns into liquid and I do like the new special effect even though it doesn't look exactly like in Deep Space Nine but at least it does look like an actual organic liquid which is what they're supposed to be so it's light years better than that special effect they did in Discovery when they show the changeling and when it shape shift it just looked like strange CGI and not like an actual organic liquid. So they did it much better this time even though it doesn't look exactly like in Deep Space Nine but it's like an updated visual effect. So anyway back on the Titan Picard and Riker keep arguing about the correct tactic. Picard keeps wanting to attack and Riker keeps wanting to hide and yet the enemy ship keeps finding them somehow. And uh, Jack is in sick bay helping to treat uh, Captain Shaw and he sees the trail of blood. And that makes him realize that there must be some way the enemy ship is tracking them. She goes and talks with Seven, who is still locked in her quarters for some reason, even though the captain is now Riker, and so why doesn't Riker let her out? He kind of forgot about her, I guess. And at no point do they think to just contact the bridge. 
to talk with them. No, they have to do everything by themselves because there are guards everywhere preventing them from coming to the bridge for some reason. Even though at some later point, Seven is able to simply contact the bridge. So why didn't she do it earlier? Later in the episode, we see that Picard takes a turbo lift from the bridge directly to sick bay. So there is a turbo lift going directly to the bridge. So how come Jack couldn't use it to get to the bridge? Maybe the turbo lift is somehow programmed to only allow officers to go to the bridge and that's why he couldn't get there. But still, it's kind of silly. Why didn't he try to convince the guard next to the bridge to let him in or at least deliver a message from him to them? Instead, he just gave up and did things his own way. So they punch out the guard and they go to look for uh, the source of the leak. Then they find some room in which there was some kind of sabotage so that the computer wouldn't realize there's a leak. And it's leaking some bullshitterium material or something. At first I thought they said deuterium, but then Seven says that she can smell it and that's why she knows it's that stuff and that it's toxic. They have to wear masks. And I'm thinking, wait a second, deuterium is just an isotope of hydrogen. So you shouldn't be able to smell it and it's definitely not toxic. So then I listened to it again and I think they said something else. It's not deuterium. It's uh, some other material. So the room is leaking bullshitterium and it's poisonous and so they have to wear masks. And the trail of bullshitterium is what allows the enemy ship to track them. So they tell that to the bridge and Picard wants to use it as a trap against the enemy. They can uh, lure them to some place and then stop the trail and then hide behind the enemy ship and to attack. But Riker doesn't want to do it, he just wants to hide. And while Jack is trying to fix the leak, he's attacked by that same ensign who looked kind of suspicious in the first episode. I noticed that right away. He's also the one who was looking out the window early in the episode. And he was always quick to respond that there is no sight of the enemy ship. Which obviously he would lie about because he doesn't want them to know when they're attacked. And so that's why he cut off that other lady to always say there is no sighting of the enemy. So he goes into the room and attacks Jack and immediately it's obvious that he's much more powerful. He's able to throw him across the room and all of that. So at that moment I was kind of really hoping it's going to be revealed it's a conspiracy bug and all of that. And then Jack punches him in the face and it kind of wobbles and shapeshifts and all of that was before the reveal of Worf with the changeling and so we didn't yet know that it's the changelings and so that was the first kind of clue and then he leaves Jack without the mask in that room and so Jack is suffocating and then they call Picard to sickbay because Jack is injured and then we have the scene of Picard in the turbo lift and that connects to what Riker told him earlier that that was the longest 17 seconds in the turbo lift so we have the same kind of scene here so I thought that was nice that creates kind of the emotional realization of what he's feeling without actually saying anything to the camera and so the acting is also good suddenly for some reason Patrick Stewart suddenly improved a lot in this episode and then he goes to sickbay and sees uh, them trying to resuscitate Jack and he's really worried and so we see that he does care about him so that was nice I think and we keep going back and forth with that scene of Rafi and Worf interrogating that guy and when Rafi touches that guy's face she thinks he's sweating a lot and uh, obviously it's not sweat it's because he's uh, turning liquid and her and Worf doing like a good cop, bad cop thing and uh, it's not clear if it was planned that way or if they're uh, really arguing about their strategy and Worf is actually the nice one, the diplomatic one trying to reason with that guy and then suddenly he asks him how long have you been away from the Great Link and only then we realize it's the changelings involved and then Jack wakes up and tells everyone about the changelings of a tour on the ship and then Worf grabs the head of the changeling which somehow does enable him to shapeshift and so he turns liquid and tries to get away and that's when he vaporizes him and I look closely and I don't see any ashes and so I'm not sure how well it connects to that scene of Riker saying the ashes look weird from that guy that Beverly vaporized and Beverly didn't know that was a changeling so I did she vaporizes him so that still annoys me and maybe those are totally different aliens and not shapeshifters if they are changelings why are they behaving like normal humanoids? Why are they in those masks? Why are they using clicks to talk with each other and not just linking with each other? And why did they have such a hard time catching Beverly if they could shapeshift? And Vadik is clearly not a shapeshifter since she's smoking, so it's still not clear if all of them are shapeshifters or just working for the changelings, which is more likely, I think, at this point. And Worf says that uh, stealing the portal tech was just a distraction, just part of their bigger plan. That they stole something else from the Astrum, which is even more dangerous. So I guess that was lore or Moriarty or something like that. I guess we'll wait and see. But obviously the portal tech is still being used by the ship of the enemy as well. Because uh, that's something cool in this episode in the battle scene. As they're trying to run away from the nebula, that ship constantly creates portals 
to bring them back to them and that was really cool visually the way they did it it's not totally original this idea existed for a, a long time i saw it in a lot of science fiction movies and shows and it was done once in a while in star trek 2 like the iconian gateways and stuff like that but they did it in a cool way here which i really liked and enjoyed and i like the fact that the ship is kind of moving slowly which makes it look heavy and clumsy and so it's not so easy to avoid going into those portals when they suddenly open in front of them so they constantly try to escape the nebula they found some clear path but they have to get away from the gas to go to warp and the enemy ship keeps creating a portal in front of them which brings them right back next to that ship also there seems to be some inconsistency with how the portal works exactly because the first time it is shown when the ship goes uh, through it seems to be instantaneous we can see it from both portals at the same time so it's as if they opened exactly the same time and yet the next times we see them there seems to be a delay first the entrance portal opens being entered into and only later the second portal appears and the thing exits so it seems to be kind of inconsistent maybe we can explain it away that you know subspace weapons are unpredictable maybe time is part of the equation of you know it is a space time portal so maybe sometimes the exit portal appears a little bit later with a bit of a time delay and sometimes not also the time it takes to charge the weapon seems to be different each time and we hear Worf telling Rafi all about the changelings being such a powerful enemy in the past and all of that wouldn't Rafi know all of that already since she was in Starfleet presumably during the Dominion War as well so why does he need to tell her all of that if she knows it it could have been so much cooler if he was telling her about those conspiracy bugs from way back in season one since maybe she didn't know about it maybe starfleet would have classified that whole event i would have enjoyed that more especially since i don't like loose ends i don't like the fact they never finished that storyline from season one instead they bring back the changelings from deep space nine which is also cool because i love the changelings in deep space nine you know all those episodes with the paranoia on the ship not knowing who might be the changeling i guess they will do something like that here as well and it might be a lot of fun so that's why i do think it has a lot of potential for future episodes it's probably going to be great i'm really hoping for it we do know we'll get lore and moriarty back and so probably there's going to be a whole bunch of villains from the previous shows which they'll have to deal with so i do think it's going to be fun so anyway Worf says that he knew about the changelings coming because he was contacted by a man of honor from inside the great link so obviously he means odo so that's a nice reference what does bug me is that if Odo knew about it and the good changelings know about it, why don't they try to stop the bad changelings? Wouldn't that be the best way to do it? So how come they just uh, let Worf know and only Worf and that's it and that's all they did to prevent it? That seems kind of strange as well. And how would any of this reignite the Dominion War? If this rogue group of changelings are not controlling the Dominion, then they wouldn't really be that dangerous. I mean, they can do a lot of trouble, they can create all these false flag attacks and create wars between different powers, but they wouldn't be able to take over anyone without an actual army of the Jem'Hadar and all of that. Anyway, I guess we'll find out later. And so anyway, the Changeling on the Titan sabotages the ship's engines, and Picard keeps telling Riker they have no choice now, they have to attack, and so uh, Riker says, fire everything we've got, and they fire a few torpedoes at the enemy ship, but then it creates a portal in front of it, and then the second portal appears behind the Titan, and those same torpedoes hit the Titan itself. And I think a lot of this episode was inspired by the movie The Hunt for Red October, which was about submarine battles, and in one part of the movie, a submarine fired a torpedo which ended up hitting itself, and one of the officers blamed the captain saying you arrogant ass you killed us all right before they get blown up so i think it was probably inspired by that movie so be thankful that at least they dropped that line you arrogant ass because if Riker said that to picard that would have annoyed me a lot more the way it was played here it's like Riker was just so depressed from the situation that he kind of took it out on Picard, I'm sure he will apologize in the next episodes, especially since, you know, it was Riker's decision to fire and Picard was only advising him, so he's kind of out of line saying that, especially in front of the rest of the crew, but it does make for an epic scene, so that's why I still kind of like it. In the same way, like that scene in First Contact when Picard was calling Worf a coward, and Worf saying, if you were any other man, I would kill you where you stand, all of that stuff is kind of out of character but it was still fun maybe because of that because it's so shocking 
that's what makes it so funny and epic and dramatic and all of that. So I do kind of like it, even though it doesn't really make much sense. But, you know, we also know that obviously they will make up later. And so maybe he will apologize for it later. So I'm willing to accept it so because I did enjoy it. I did like that scene and the music and everything is great. And the scene, the ship kind of slowly sinking, falling down into that black void and all of that. It also reminds me of the parody video I made on my other channel in which was comparing the Titanic to the Titan because there were some similar scenes in that movie. And now they're saying they're literally sinking into that anomaly. And earlier they said there was something really strange in that nebula, some unknown anomaly. And so that's something I love, you know, it made me feel like in those early episodes of TNG when they had some kind of strange mystery, some kind of weird thing going on, which we don't yet know what it is. And also in that scene when Jack was unconscious, he was having some kind of strange vision in which he saw some strange vines growing on the ship and some kind of strange voice telling him to connect the branches and to come and find her or something like that. So there's something weird which we don't yet know the full picture of. There's something strange inside that nebula, some kind of biological signature. So maybe the whole nebula is some kind of giant organism that uh, Vulcan Lady says it's something unlike anything Starfleet encountered before. But uh, Starfleet did encounter giant life forms before, so that would annoy me if it turns out to be something that we did see before, and yet that ensign says it's something Starfleet never encountered, so that will be annoying if it turns out to be something that we did see before, so hopefully it will be something totally new and surprising. And I do love the mystery of it, it makes me feel like I used to feel as a kid watching the early TNG episodes with mysteries and strange things. And how come the ship of the bad guys is not trying to catch them with a the tractor beam? Didn't their whole mission was to capture Jack alive, so why are they now allowing the ship to fall apparently to its doom? And so it doesn't really make much sense, but the way everything was done in this episode both visually and the music and the acting, it did feel like a really good Star Trek movie. So anyway, that's my opinion. Let me know what you think and we can discuss all of this in the comments below. And I will see you all next time. Bye bye.